we're going to, I'm going to teach on the fruit of Holy Spirit, what that is. Because we've had the last two messages we have discussed uh, who he is and taught about who Holy Spirit is. We know he's the third person of the Godhead. And we know in John 14, 16, that's our little foundational scripture. We're going to go there. And so, Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your presence. I ask that you would just speak a word through these lips of clay today, Father, a word that would strengthen these, your people, and those that are watching, Father, that it would challenge them in their walk with you today. Because, Father, we know without any challenge, there is no change. And so, Father, we don't want to be uh, conforming to the will of man, Father God, or we don't want to conform and continue to walk in the flesh, Father, but we want to understand Holy Spirit, we want to understand your fruit. We want to understand who you are, Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we just thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to start at John 14, 16, uh, when Jesus was speaking. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. And so Jesus was speaking of the third person of the Godhead, Holy Spirit, and how he had to go away and he was going to release him. He said, I'll pray to the Father and he release him into the earth for you. He said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He said, I will come to you. And so if we go down to, let's go down to verse, um, let's go to verse 26. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And so Jesus says again, he says, look, I'm going away. He said, and I will come to you. And so we know in Acts 1, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 1, the birth of the church came with power of Holy Spirit. And you, you can go back on, I think they put them up on YouTube, so you can go back and listen to that or, or ask for, you know, a CD, whatever, if you don't do Internet. You know, we have different ways in which you can get the word. Hallelujah. And so in Acts 1, it says that um, in verse 8, he says, But you shall receive power. This is Jesus speaking. When Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And Acts 2, he comes in verse 1. Then the day of Pentecost had come. They were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And, I, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Hallelujah. I know, right? So there you see how Holy Spirit entered in, why he came, and, and now he's here, he's upon us. That We talked about the gift, gifts of the Holy Spirit or uh, the functions of Holy Spirit. We've, we've ministered all of that, and I want to speak on the fruit of Holy Spirit. And so, see, gifts are given, but fruit is grown, Okay, and so gifts, it's to me, it's easier to operate in the gift of Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit is the gift. I believe that every believer can operate in the nine gifts, right? As the Spirit wills, we discussed that. But I want to talk about his fruit today. <laughs> Growing fruit is a little more challenging at times, isn't it? Because there's always a conflict with the fruit of Holy Spirit versus your flesh. So thank you, Father. So let's go to Matthew uh, 12, 33 first. So we're going to walk the word today. That's what we do. It's going to help you and it's going to empower you. In Matthew 12. Uh-huh. We'll start there. Matthew 12, 33. It says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. And then Jesus um, begins to rebuke. He says, you bro of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For, for the mouth speaks out of that which the, fills the heart. 
the good man out of the good treasure that which is good and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil he says but i tell you that every careless word that people speak they will give an accounting for it on the day of judgment he said by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned so he's saying what's inside of you will come out of your mouth right and he said he said that there's a storehouse in your heart. That's why you got to guard your heart. That's why you got to allow God to clean out that which is unlike the nature of Jesus, right? And you got to learn to crucify our flesh. We have to learn all of these things. And it's only done by the power of Holy Spirit. No one can change their own heart and make it, make it good. Okay, you can try and be good all day by yourself, but without the regeneration work of the power of God within you, you will never change. Without the supernatural power of God in your life, things stay the same. And so we need, we need to understand this Holy Spirit, not the, not it, but the third person, Holy Spirit, that's his name. And we need to know his, his nature and how he operates. And so... In Matthew 6, uh, I think it's Matthew 6. Let me find it here. God is good. That's not the right place, so we'll just continue on. But he talks about um, it's another reference for knowing your fruit and, and, and operating in the fruit of Holy Spirit. And so go to Galatians 5. I just referenced that twice. We don't need it twice. You're going to get a lot of scripture. You know you're used to that, right? I know when Nina came, she goes, there's going to be a lot of scripture. I said, oh, they can, they can handle it. <laughs> That's normal. <laughs> and so in Galatians 5, um, let's start with verse 6. He said, for in Christ Jesus, either circumcision or uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Say love. Because Holy Spirit is love. He says, you were running well, he said, who hindered you from obeying the truth? He said, this persuasion did not come from him who calls you. He said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. He said, but I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear it judgment, whoever he is. He says, but I, brethren, he said, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Even the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. He said, I wish that those who are troubling you, he said, would even uh, mutilate themselves. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? That's how serious it is that you follow God and let no one pull you out. Let no one persuade you in another direction is what he's saying. He says, you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity, what? For the flesh. He says, but through love, serve one another. So there's love. You're going to see love interwoven around this whole thing because God is love. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in one statement. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. He says, but I say, walk in the spirit. He's talking about Holy Spirit here, isn't he? Walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of your flesh. He says, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And that's why people need uh, deliverance today. That's why God is, you know, bringing it back because his church needs to be delivered from some works of the flesh that have become demonically rooted in their heart. It's one thing to crucify your flesh, and you have to do that every day. I had to do it today when I got up. Every day, choose life, choose death, right? And so when you're learning to crucify your flesh, at first, it's a duty to you. You'll hear me say the three Ds because it's true. In our walk, first, it's a duty. Oh, then it's a discipline. You pass up the duty, you're going to do it, and you're going to discipline yourself. You know, when it's a duty, you make yourself. When it's a discipline, you know it's your responsibility to do it, and you discipline. But then as you continue to discipline yourself, you, it becomes a delight to you. It's a delight to love people. It's a delight to be kind. It's a delight to be faithful. It's a delight 
to, to operate in goodness and, and gentleness and all of the fruits where we're going to here in a minute, right? And so we thank God. And, and you know, when you continue to sit in an area of the flesh, that's when things set up in us and we need Jesus to deliver us. And so that's the battle he's talking about here. He said, but if you're led by the spirit, he says, you are not under the law. He says, but the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are what? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions. That word dissensions means discord and quarrels. That's a work of the flesh. And so you find yourself getting in quarrels a lot or, or um, having hostility in your heart or hatred. Man, that's, that's ugly, isn't it? That's a work of the flesh. That's not the mind of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? He said factions, that means divisions, envying, drunkenness. Well, it's going to be a good word today. We got car horns going off, phones going off. What? <laughs> All right, back up here. <laughs> Lord knows we need it. It's a good indication, isn't it? Dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, in God, there is no mixture. There's a grace for us to walk this thing out. Thank God. Without grace, we wouldn't be saved today. But a continual practice of the works of the flesh bring no life to you. It's not going to happen. Okay? And, and there's no inheritance in the kingdom operating in this. He said, but look at the fruit of the Spirit. He said, it's love. It's joy. It's peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. He said, now those who belong to Christ Jesus. So if you're born again in here today and you're saved or, you know, you've received Christ. He says, you have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. He says, but if we live by the spirit, he said, let us also walk by the spirit. And so let's talk about these fruits. I broke them down. Uh, so we're going to go. We're going to speak about these. So we know Holy Spirit is the dunamis power of God. Right? Yes, we talked about the gifts, all the gifts and the power of God that he operates in. But, but now let's look at his nature. Let's look at his character right here. So he gives us power over the enemy. And he also gives us power over the, our flesh. <laughs> right? And so he is the character, the nature of Jesus. And so the Greek word here for fruit, me, it's translated as something that is edible, like fruits and vegetables, right? Just like it says, because Jesus said we were trees <laughs> and we bear something, good or bad fruit, rotten fruit or good fruit. We're bearing something Okay, it's evident because it shows in our daily life. It shows in our daily relationships. See, see, we can we can work a gift, and everybody can see the effects of the gift, right? But this fruit right here is grown in everyday life when nobody's looking. That's why it's so valuable to God, because it's it's produced. It, when things are not comfortable, it, it's produced. And so, and it, and it also shows God, it demonstrates our love to our Father that we just sang about. Because when I love my Father, I want to produce good fruit. When I love my Father, I crucify my desires because Jesus said that we are to deny ourselves. So that means that I deny myself because I love my God. And I know I must bear him something to what? Eat. We say that. What do you do with fruit? You eat it. We got it back there all the time. And we eat fruit, right? Jesus is hungry to eat the fruit that you're bearing for him. That ought to make you want to do some good things, right? Amen. Amen. And so, remember, this is about character and nature today. And so... 
It also means as an offspring, as a deed, this word fruit means offspring. This word fruit means a deed, an action, a result, or a profit of something. Of who? Holy Spirit. You're, you, are this, you have the seed of God in you. So God is jealous for what he's put in you. And so God is looking for the fruit of Holy Spirit, the deeds, he, the action, the result of Holy Spirit in your life. Okay? And so this fruit is a good thing. And it is a result of, guess what? Hard work and careful tending. It is. It, you have to cultivate. Cultivating speaks of gardening. Uh, George was um, getting weeds out of the garden this last week. And he had sweat just running down. Uh, thank God for him. Right? Amen. Thank God for every father in here. And we do have a gift for you. And we're going to pray for you at the end. We thank God for Father's Day. Amen. And so, but he was just sweating. He was working the garden. And that's what it is in the spirit realm. Sometimes it's hard work until you master that thing. You have to master some of these things. I'm here to tell you, fruit, remember, it has to be grown. And you've got to tend to the garden of your own heart, the own soil of your heart. And so the devil will come to get you to forfeit or to stop tending to that fruit because it's too hard. That's the one you need to work on. Amen? Yeah. And so, deed, action, um, or action, it's the result makes bearing fruit more personable because it's about your deed. See, I can't grow good fruit for you. I have to tend to my own garden. <laughs> I can't go into your home with you. And even if I did go into your home and I began to deal with some bad fruit or behavior that I saw in your home. That's what counseling is for, is to try and help people, right? But even if I give instruction from the word of God or try and help you to cultivate fruit in that area, if you don't do it when I'm not there, it's just not going to profit anything, is it? It's just going to be a constant releasing words but you're not going to grow anything because you have the responsibility to grow fruit especially after today you're having more why because you're getting the word on it so god is saying i want to see some more fruit in your life this is not condemning because remember the same spirit that raised christ from the dead dwells in you you are able to produce him some fruit and so this result and work of the Spirit of God in our lives is by the work of love. Love. What I read about. That's, that's the, the release, the love in your heart with the power of the Holy Spirit is going to cause you to grow some things. And love is at the foundation. That's how God knows the difference. You're marked by love. What you do in love is what you get rewarded for. If you just be kind because it's the right thing to do, but if you be kind because you love God and you're, you're developing, because I know you got to develop love for people, right? The, I find the more that I love my father, the more I love people. The more I love my father, the more compassion I have for others. But if I don't have a love, intimate relationship with my father, it's very difficult to love other people because mm -hmm. I'm trying to do it out of my own strength, right? To so help us, Lord. And so a deeper, a deeper relationship with Holy Spirit. So you love God first, love others. The two greatest commandments. Jesus said it. So what is the word love? Let's break it down. The Greek word love is agape here. Agape is the perfect love. Abba's love. Amen. Agape is a perfect love that only God can give. It is a deep and constant love and an entrance. It's an interest of a perfect God. And so that means that there's a deep, constant love and God is interested in you. And it's perfect. It's not human. Right? Because truth is, there's some folks you cannot love unless you have the love of God in you, abiding in you. Then you can love the unlovely, right? Because the Bible says in the last days that the love of many, what? Wax cold. And that means it's harsh, it's cruel. They're, they're, they don't have love. And so 
that means that God is a perfect God and that means that God, this agape love is released on unworthy objects. Hello, we're not worthy. But because he first loved us, you see, so his love that, that is released upon us, it, uh, it empowers me and it causes me. And this agape kind of love, when you feel it and you experience it, it produces and it fosters a reverential love toward the giver of the love you see what i'm saying like when you feel and you experience god's love it causes me to return it back and to seek him more mm -hmm. it's awesome it's like a magnet okay it is powerful and it also it not only will cause me to seek god more but it extends love toward those who are partakers of the same love. Uh, that's how there can be love in a community, in a kingdom community like this. That's how we can love one another and, 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 and you know, cover one another and do all those things because the agape love dwells in the house. That's it. Because we can't do that in our own strength, right? So this love causes you to seek the giver of that love. Let's go to John 15. Jesus said, me and the Father, we're one. He loved him so much, he didn't do his own will. He did what his Father said. And yet he was God. John 15, 9, it says, just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. He said, abide in my love. He said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So abiding in him, abiding in Christ will cultivate and, and you cannot help but grow in love in Jesus because God is love and he dwells in you. Someone said to me, I don't know how to love people um, years ago, not recently, okay? But someone spoke that to me, and I said, are you saved? I said, are you really saved? Because John, 1 John 3, let's go there now, you know, because I'm just going there. 1 John 3, 15, or 14 says, you know that we have passed out of death unto life because we love the brethren. You see that? You know you've passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> he who does not love abides in death. So don't let the devil tell you you can't love people. If you're saved, guess what? You're going to love others. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this and that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. He said, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and does not and, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? He said, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. You see that? God's speaking here. He says, we know that by this, that we are of the truth and we assure our hearts before him in whatever your heart condemns us for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. If our hearts does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. That's the truth. So when I read this, okay, what this is saying to me is that whatever our heart condemns us. So when we're growing in our relationship with Jesus, okay, we're learning him. We're reading his word. We're learning him. And we sometimes still have the flesh in operation over here. And it's out of control. Let's tell the truth, right? And it could be in the area of loving other people because you're wounded. Because you've been abused. Because you've been abandoned. Something could have happened to you, okay, that caused you to put your walls up and even make vows that say, I'll never love anybody again. I'll never, what, trust anybody again. Those things come out of our mouth. It's the truth, right? They shouldn't because we're snared by that. 
And so when we have these things in us, those are the things that will buffet you from opening your heart and receiving not only the love of God, but be able to love other people. It's so true, right? That's why the healing needs to come. That's why we must get healed in our soul, right? We must walk in forgiveness. If I have unforgiveness, I cannot love correctly. It ain't going to happen because unforgiveness is a defiling spirit. So when I have unforgiveness toward myself, I can't love myself. If I have unforgiveness uh, with other people, I can't love them either. And so you're always going to have walls. You're always going to have things that come up and hinder you from uh, loving like Christ when your heart needs tended to. Remember, it's a cultivating your garden. <laughs> it's tending to. It's pulling out the weeds that I talked about earlier. It's getting rid of the things that are keeping you from loving people. And a lot of it, too, is rejection. The fear of people rejecting your love because your love has been rejected. And, and that hurts so bad because, remember again, the healing isn't there. So when you get rejected, it's hard for you to love like God until God deals with your enemy of rejection. And he will do that if you let him. Amen? So we're talking about the agape love today that comes from the Father. I read this article. Let's go to uh, Matthew 5. I shared it. I read this article about this... Um, Jewish woman that survived the Holocaust. Man, woo wee. Some of you probably read it. Man, that was powerful. How she went through all of that horrific torture, survived, and her sister died. And the man that repeatedly raped her sister, they were starving these women, everything. It was horrific, horrific story. But the, the guard got saved. This is years later. He found the Lord. He comes and he finds the survivor. And he goes to her and he says, I want to ask you if you can please forgive me for what I did to you and your sister. Now remember, this woman is born again. I think she was even minister and all that stuff now. And she had to look at her abuser and the one that tortured them and all of that. And she said it was hard. It was so hard, and she said it was just, it, and she knew the word. She knew that the word said, forgive, and I will forgive you. She knew all the right answers, okay? But in her heart, she was tested with, am I going to forgive this man or not? It was her choice. I want you to hear that. God didn't come down in the flesh and command her, did he? She knew the word says, you must forgive and so she said uh, really a powerful thing. She said it wasn't about the feelings she had. She knew it wasn't about the feelings because the feelings will steer you the other way. And so she knew it was about obedience to her father. And she agape her God so much that she could extend her hand and shake the man's hand that tortured her and killed her sister and did all those horrible things. She reached out, she took his hand, and she said, I forgive you and I release you. Wow, come on now. What a power. And she said, as, and she said it because she was still hurting from that, even though God had done much healing. But she said when he took her hand and she did it in obedience, she said the power of God came down over them. And she said a liquid fire went through both of them from God. Who was that? Holy Spirit. Because she was operating in something that was supernatural. It's supernatural to love like God. Why? It's not in your own strength. It's supernatural. You can't love like God in the flesh. You can't agape nothing. It's going to be how you feel. It's going to be all those things. It's going to be what you can give me. You give me something, I'll love you. That's not agape. God loved us when we were yet sinners. Christ died for us, right? So you see where God has to help us, especially in this era right now with all the hatred going on and the racism and that filthy stuff in the earth just spewing. But that's not who we are. We're kingdom people. We agape others. Amen? And so you can't do that in your feelings. I want you to hear me because some people struggle with this number one fruit, love. They struggle with it, but it's, it's not about the feelings. It's about an act of my will to forgive. 
and to extend, extend love. You extend it by action because these, these fruits here are about deeds. It's not just about saying, yeah, I have the love of Holy Spirit. Really? I want to see it. I love other people. Really? I want to see it. That's what God is saying. Amen. And so, and, and thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We can do this. Amen. <laughs> Matthew 5, 43. Did I say that? That is good. Um, did I read it yet? Okay. Went on a Holy Ghost trail, so. You know, I don't know where I'm going now. No. <laughs> Matthew 5. See, he knows what you need to hear today. 5, 43. He says, Jesus speaking. Well, let's go up. You know I do go backwards like that. Matthew 5, verse 37. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything be beyond this is evil. He says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, whoa, that's why he had me go up. Turn the other to him. <laughs> if anyone wants to, to uh, sue you and take your shirt, he said, let him have your coat too. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. He said, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. You see that? You see the mercy of God? He says, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He says, but if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? He says, do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? He says, do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That word perfect right here. Come on. He says, therefore, you must be perfect. Look what it means. Growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character. Having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity of your father that we just sang about. He says, I want you to continue to grow in these attributes. See, you can't do that in your flesh, can you? No, because you want to pull out the taser or what you're carrying. Come on. We know, we know how we are. <laughs> it's the truth. But by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit will restrain me. Oh, he's awesome. He will restrain my fleshly anger if I yield to him. But I have a choice. I have a choice. And don't think, well, he didn't. Holy Spirit didn't talk to me. Are you saved? Come on. <laughs> he's speaking to you right now. See, he's talking. We think sometimes he ain't talking and we can just do what we want. No, he's been talking, but you've not been what? Listening. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He's so awesome. Romans 8. He's helping us. He says, your love's going to go deeper because they're going to know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. Hallelujah. I love it. Uh, one of my sons was overseas, and he was being kind to some people that um, were from another land. I'm not going to say who or where, but most people weren't kind to them because of the culture they represented, okay? But he was kind to them, and he was buying them. They were working together, and, and uh, he's in the service, but he was kind to them, and he was giving them Gatorades and water and just being kind. And do you know what these people that did not know Jesus say to him? They were in another culture, in another faith. You know what I'm talking about. They said to him, you must be a Christian. What? How did they know? He never said it. Just an act of love and kindness toward those that other people persecuted because the color of their skin and the nation they came out of, they were judging them accordingly. And here he just gives Gatorade. 
He had compassion. That didn't come out of his flesh. That act of kindness came out of the love of the Father, the seed of God that's within him. These acts, when you feel compelled to do acts of love and kindness for other people, don't be pride and think it's you. <laughs> no, it's the God in you. See what I'm saying? So we do a lot of things for other people and acts of love, and we think, oh, we just thought about that. When Hannah went home and she says, I need to make Dr. Nina, I need to make Nina a picture. That was something God put in her. We didn't know the depths of what a rainbow and a waterfall meant to her, did we? But it broke her down. That was the love of God operating in an act of kindness. There was love on the Gatorade. There was love on a picture. It was supernatural. See, you, you get it. Some of you are getting what I'm saying. It was supernatural. Why? Because the spirit of love was released out of that act from the Father. The idea came from him. Amen. So praise God. You're seeing something here. Number two, joy. Let's talk about joy. So we know the opposite of love. I'm going to give you the opposite because you might have some of that stuff in there. The opposite means um, indifference. It means lack of concern or interest. Okay? It means hate and fear. The opposite of love, hate, fear. So those are things you got to get out of your heart, right? So you can operate in more love. Number two is joy. So the opposite of joy is misery, despair, and tribulation. We don't want that. We want the joy of the Lord is our strength. So the fruit of Holy Spirit is joy. Joy means just what it says, joy or delight. It is after. It is often seen in the word with gladness. Joy and gladness together. Amen. It is a realization of God's favor and God's grace in your life. When you realize the favor and the grace of God, you can't help but have joy. You can't help but have gladness in your heart, even through adversity. And so the biblical joy is, it's, it, it looks like happiness to us, okay? Okay. But it's different because it's not dependent on your own circumstances. Oh, true. It's true. James 1 and 2, it says, Consider it pure joy. That's the same word. My brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let's go to Jeremiah 33. So, some of you just need to have a good laugh. Uh, Pastor, we talked about that. Uh, Pastor Bertha and I, we were down uh, south, and we were having a lot of warfare. And uh, Vicky comes, and Elder Vicky, she begins to just, you know, speak in this tongue. I don't know what it was. But whatever it was, it released joy into us. It could have been Abba saying joy over and over again, joy over and over again, because something happened in the hotel room, something that was supernatural. I don't laugh like that. You all know I'm kind of serious, really. I don't, I don't mean to be, but, but I just began to laugh. And I began to laugh. And Pastor was laughing. And Kim was laughing. And Vicky was laughing. And we were on a four-way butt, just gut laughing, rolling everywhere, on the bed, off the bed. We couldn't contain ourselves. It hurt. <laughs> you ever laugh so hard that it hurt? Crying, yes, tears coming, belly hurting, face just couldn't quit because we couldn't quit laughing. That's not normal. But what happened, it was supernatural, and it was released in that room, and it broke through, and God mocked the enemy and downloaded everything we needed to say and to do the rest of the weekend. Amen. Joy broke through. I like that kind of weapon. Jeremiah 33, 11 because you're going to see joy with gladness. Mm -hmm. It says, and the voice of joy and the voice of gladness. You see that? The voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of those who say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts. For the Lord is good and his loving kindness is everlasting. 
and of those who bring a thank offering to the house of the Lord. He says, for I will restore the fortunes of all the land as they were at first, says the Lord. What a powerful scripture. And so there is joy and gladness together in Holy Spirit that you can have. It is a fruit and, you, and people will see it come out of you. I, I haven't known my sister long, Teresa, but man, every time I see her, it's joy. You know, it's this Teresa right there. It's true. I see joy a lot. Don't you see it? You know, and some people can walk in the room. They carry the spirit of joy. It's true. Now, we can all carry that, but it's also a yielding to joy, isn't it? It's a, it is a, um, it is, <laughs> it's an effort sometimes to think about the good things. Jeremiah 33 says to think about it, to thank God for goodness, right? And so when you begin to do that, you begin to do the sacrifice. That's what we're talking about here today, trying to get people to what? To have a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving so joy can fill your heart. And then joy comes out to other people. That's a fruit and a work of Holy Spirit. It is. Now, you'll see in this, in some attributes you will see, we should see all of this in all of us at some time or another. We should be manifesting these fruits, right? But you'll see that some have more than others in certain areas. That that's, that's means that we need to work on bearing fruit in all the, in all the areas, amen? We got to work on that. Isaiah 44, because you have Holy Spirit, you can do that. You can have love and joy. You can have that. Isaiah 44, 23 because Jesus wants to see some good fruit, right? He gave a lot for you to be to have this joy. He says, "Shout for joy, O heavens, for the Lord has done it." Boy, you got to write that on your fridge. Shout joyfully, you lower parts of the earth, break forth into a shout of joy, you mountains, O forest and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and in Israel he shows forth his glory. So you see the release of glory. I'm telling you, glory, joy is real. It's real. Zephaniah is another scripture, 317. It says, the Lord, your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. It says, he will exalt over you with joy. And another version says, sing over you. <laughs> he will be, he said, he will be quiet in his love. And he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So God, that's one of the natures of Jesus was joy. And, and you know when, when the children, his disciples came back after they were doing everything he told them to do, the Bible says that Jesus shouted with joy. He rejoiced. Actually, it says he rejoiced. That word rejoice means that word joy. It means that he twirled around in circles. He acted radically just uh, yes, and he was shouting, and he was jumping, and he was twirling. Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. That's what rejoiced means. It was a celebration to him that they got it, that they were doing it. He knew he had to leave, and he left it in their care. Come on, that's intense, right? And they got it. And so the next thing is peace. Hmm. Number three, peace. <laughs> The opposite of peace is a bunch of noise, a bunch of irritation, and a bunch of conflict. The devil is a liar. We squash that right now. That's the flesh part, okay? But the Spirit of God gives us peace. Peace is life without conflict. <laughs> oh, Lord. It means wholeness. It means harmony with God and others. It means to have quiet rest. You can't do that in your mind, can you? <laughs> no, because we're all going through some stuff, right? At different times and seasons, we go through something, but it's deeper. This piece is deeper. The Hebrew word for that is shalom, but this word means a life of peace is safe and secure physically and mentally. See, you can go through the fire, but still maintain peace of Holy Spirit. And that is also a choice, isn't it? Because it's what you meditate on. It's what, you pull, what you're pulling from. When you're going through something, are you pulling from your flesh for some kind of gratification? Because it ain't going to work to give you peace. 
Or are you pulling from who? Holy Spirit, who is peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. So I draw my peace and my strength from him. And so Romans 8, 6 says, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. How you know you need to work on these areas is if you're going through a conflict or a crisis or maybe, maybe your money is funny. Come on. And then all of a sudden, you know, you don't have no peace no more. You've done lost your joy. You're irritated. There, you're, you have conflict inside of you. Seasons will change. Come on. This is a temporary thing. I fix my eyes on what is eternal, not on what is natural. And so our flesh don't like to be discomforted, does it? But sometimes God will take you through to show you what's in your heart and the areas you need to have more of Holy Spirit working in. Peace is a result of allowing Holy Spirit to work in your hearts and in your minds. Being pliable and obedient to Jesus brings me peace. Man, when I'm stubborn against God, I have no rest. Because peace gives me rest. If, if I am um, stubborn or I'm not allowing God to change me in an area, there you ain't going to have no peace. And, he's, and your peace is going to be, uh, it's going to be nowhere to find because you have to yield to God, right? John 16, says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace, Jesus speaking. He said, in the world you will have trouble. He said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And so Jesus is telling us that in him we can abide in peace, even in difficult situations. Okay, it's where I'm pulling my support from because we have the spirit of peace within us. Number four is patience, right? Patience, oh, the opposite, of course, is impatient, right? <laughs> Everybody got a little moving around on this one. So patience. Patient means I have endurance. Oh, it means I have steadfastness. It means a patient waiting. It means to remain under. It means I have consistency and I'm long suffering. Patience. So, Holy Spirit empowers us to withstand challenging situations with perseverance and endurance. People say, I don't have no patience. It's because you don't want to deal with your pride. Tell the truth, right? Pride is a work of the flesh. We don't want to deal with our pride. That's why we're impatient. So Holy Spirit, with Holy Spirit, we are able to wait longer before we would indulge in our fleshly passions. It's true. Because I have patience. I will, be, I will patiently wait on the Lord. Amen. 1 Timothy 1.16, he says, But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me the worst of sinners, now look what he's saying, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience. So God just doesn't have patience for you. He has immense patience. <laughs> Jessica said, he has to. He has to with me. Immense patience. He is long suffering right hallelujah paul says he says i'm the worst of sinners he said but he said christ jesus might display his immense patience as for as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life he said i'm encouraging you church is what he was saying if I'm the chief of sinners and God had immense patience with me, a murderer of souls, of people, he said, this is written so you will take courage and strengthen that. Ephesians 4, 1 and 2 says, be completely humble and gentle and patient. Learn, patient. He said, bearing with one another in love. And so you are your brother's keeper in the kingdom, so you have to be patient with one another. Everybody's on their own journey. Holy Spirit helps us. James 1.19, he says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. How do you do that? Patient. You patiently wait. 
don't you? Colossians 3.12, another scripture, he says, So as those, he said, who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now you notice he said you got to put it on. <laughs> you got to put it, it's a choice, isn't it? It is a choice because remember all of these things, because in the beginning I said you, you want to be led by the spirit, not the flesh. And so he says patience, you got to put it on. Patience will cause you to be a finisher. You can't finish anything in the kingdom without patience. I'm here to tell you it's not going to happen. So patience. Number five is kindness. Kindness means a good nature, a good disposition. The opposite of kindness is, of course, meanness. <laughs> being mean, being hateful, right? So kindness is moral goodness. It means integrity. It means usefulness, behaving properly. Kindness, right? Let's go to Romans 2. We can do this. Hallelujah. You say, well, this is a simple message, but boy, we need to be reminded. Romans 2. Yep. He says, let's go up. Um, verse 1, it says, therefore, he says, you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. He says, for you who judge practice the same things. He says, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. He says, but do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? For, or do you think lightly of the richness, riches of his kindness? You see that? God has that towards you. Kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God lead, leads you to repentance. And so God is saying in this scripture that, that his kindness led you to himself. Amen. And we are to what? Have that same kindness toward who? Others. How can you do it? By the fruit of Holy Spirit, by the power of Holy Spirit within you. And so Holy Spirit enables us to have moral integrity. He will enable you to do that with kindness and not get uh, trapped into self-righteous judgment. So you got you to stay out of that because that's opposite of kindness. Romans eleven twenty two is another one. It says, Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell. He said, Severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So we have an obligation as a child of God to be kind. So you know what? When you're out and about at those restaurants, how do you treat your server? How do you treat people on the phone? How do you treat bill collectors if they call you? How do you treat people? Let's tell the truth. Kindness. See, we want to be kind to those that are kind. But the Bible says that a kind word turns away what? Wrath. And do you know these fruits can be seen even on your face? Oh, Lord. Even on my face. It's true. You can see when someone is not kind. The scrow on their face, the attitude, the attitude. You know, there's some restaurants, the, the servers just cannot stand Sundays. I was a server for years. I remember the comments about church people. They were the worst tippers and they were the meanest. Some of you waitresses are shaking your head. That should not be. What is that? Self-righteousness. I'm better than them. So you're coming into a restaurant. You need to be the best tippers. You need to be the most kind. Why? Because you want to lead them to Christ. You want them to say, oh, they ain't like those other churches, whoever they are. You know what I'm saying. It's the truth, though, isn't it? That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's the mark that God is in you is your kindness. 
It's the truth. People don't go to church today. They have fallen away from the church today because there's not been these fruits of Holy Spirit evident in that body. People weren't kind. People weren't loving. People weren't joyful. People didn't have no peace. Why you want to come into a house? If you don't find that in there, you guys will stay out there, right? Because what's the difference? We're to be marked by Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, I'm trying to help us today, right? Because you're going to remember that server next time you go out to eat. Hmm. <laughs> the next one is goodness. Goodness. Opposite of goodness is wickedness. So goodness means uprightness, it, uprightness of heart and life. Goodness is seen in our actions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop at being good, but it means to do good. This is a verb. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you just stop at, you know, it means you're going to do something. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 says, We pray for God's power to help you to do all the good things you hope to do. Now look at this. And your faith makes you want to do. <laughs> So faith should make us, if you have faith, you should desire to do good works. If you're saved, come on. If you have the spirit of God on the inside of you, it says right here, he prays for God's power. Who is that? Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit will help you to do all the good things you hope to do. See, we, I hope to do some good things, right? I'm, I'm hoping. I have a lot of hope and expectation to do some good things for God. He said, and your faith makes you want to do it. I don't just hope, but I desire. I have a want to do some things. Amen. So through Holy Spirit, we are empowered to do good works. Through Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.17, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Another scripture, 2 Thessalonians 2.17, he says, Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. So we should not only have good works, but we have good speech. Our speech is good. That's how you know. That's how people know you have Christ in you. It's what comes out of your mouth, right? It's what you do on the outside. 1 Timothy 6.18, he says, Instruct them to do good to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. So God sees good, sees sharing as a spirit of goodness. <laughs> Come on. God sees it as your being. That's my good child. They're producing good fruit. They're sharing, being generous. God says that's a work of goodness coming out of my children. God, it pleases Abba. It pleases the Father when we do good things, right? Ephesians 2.10, he says, For we are his workmanship, right? Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And so when we are his workmanship created in Christ, he says, I have created some things for you to what? To do. Amen. Matthew 5, 16, he says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so that scripture is telling me that good works release a glory in the earth. Good works are important. It's very valuable to God to do good works. And it releases glory in the earth. Amen. Number seven, come on, faithfulness. Faithfulness comes out of faith. You say, well, how do, I be, how do I operate in faithfulness? Do you have faith? You will grow in your faithfulness. The opposite, of course, is disloyalty, faithlessness. And so faithfulness is a character trait that combines dependability and trust based on your confidence in God. So you can't be faithful without faith because it's actually the same root word. Faith, it means faith, it means belief, it means trust, and it means confidence. So God's divine persuasion is inside of you. You need to say that. God's divine persuasion is inside of you. It's in you by the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural power that causes you to walk in faith and be faithful to everything that he's put in your heart. 
So whatever he's packaged inside of you, he's give you, because remember he told Jeremiah, before I formed you, I knew you. He said, I put inside of you a prophet gift to the nation. So it tells us that everybody in here, God has packaged and put something inside of you. And inside of the purpose that has been placed within you is a faith to be able to do it. You can't separate purpose and faith. You can't separate that. God's divine persuasion is in you. That's why many people, you, you, you're uncomfortable if you're not doing what God has called you to do. And so God's divine persuasion in your heart causes you to trust and believe. It is a guarantee of the fulfillment of the revelation that he has put within you. So when God puts a revelation in you, okay, there is a divine persuasion to complete it. Praise God. I know it's heavy around here today, but come on. Maybe you're just eating. I don't know. <laughs> but you hear what I'm saying. There is a divine persuasion. That divine is Holy Spirit. It's the power of God that he's put within you. Thank you, Jesus. So God has allotted that to you. Um, I'm just going to go faster now. Huh? I mean, I, do I, Holy Spirit? Okay. Ephesians 2 8 by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's a gift of God and not a result of your works that no one can boast so you got to understand that what God has deposited in you it is what from him and you can't earn it you can't make it you cultivate it you tend to it and so God has allotted all of us a measure of faith and he's put it within us to complete some things in the earth and that thing as we grow it in what obedience it grows if you never step out in what God has put within you it will never grow um, help help us Lord so many are humble and many many you got to become humble and understand that it is the Lord Romans 10 17 faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God so cultivating getting in the word will grow and develop that area that you lack amen it'll happen in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, in this, he says, In this case, it is required that stewards be found what? Faithful. Trustworthy and faithful cannot be separated. If I find somebody that is faithful, I can trust them. <laughs> God sees that with us. If you're faithful in something, he can trust to give you more. Right? Because that's how the kingdom is. You're faithful in the little things. You'll make you ruler over much. That's every area of your life. The next thing, two more, gentleness, it means meekness. A gentle, gentleness is a fruit, an attribute of Holy Spirit. And it, meekness does not mean weakness. All right? That pride will tell you meekness is for sissies. Mm -hmm, it will. Pride will tell you that pride is a liar. Meekness, God is not a sissy. Come on. <laughs> oh, no. He's meek. Jesus. Wow. He was led like a lamb to be sheared when he could have called down legions of angels and wiped everybody out. Jesus could have operated in power anytime he wanted because he had the authority to do so, but yet he was meek and humble. Right? Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, it says, Jesus speaking, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Meekness brings a rest. Oh, it's awesome. Meekness will cause you to rest in the bosom of the Father, and you will not have to, to, to be carried away and to worry and to have all those things so meekness is also a dear friend of mine told me power under submission mm, it's good isn't it expresses power with reserve and gentleness <laughs> that's what meekness does so really meekness and gentleness you could put them together it is a divinely balanced virtue that can only operate through faith by Holy Spirit. You can't do that in your own strength, right? It is the power of Holy Spirit. Meekness, 
means hum- this word gentleness means humility. It means mildness. Okay, humility. Ephesians four two says with all humility and gentleness with patience. Now look here. There's humility, gentleness, and patience. He said, show tolerance for one another in love. <laughs> tolerance for one another in love. Help us, Lord. But see, when I choose to obey God in these areas, when it's hard for my flesh, there is a power that is released to you from God. And you'll be able to do it. Because it's supernatural. Remember, it's not you doing it. It's the power of God flowing through you to do it. But you have to yield to it. Remember, choose life or choose death. The Spirit of God inside you knows when you choose the wrong way. Oh, yeah. He'll convict you. He'll check you. You'll know. You'll feel, ugh. Forgive me, Holy Spirit. I'm going to choose life today. Right? So it's that simple. We make it too hard. So the opposite of being gentle, of course, is being brutal, unkind, and and harsh with people. Harshness. Harsh. Cutting people. No. Gentleness. Right? Kindness. Gentleness. Yes. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. 21, Paul says, What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? He said, I could come with the rod. Y'all need it. You've been sinning. You've been doing some bad things. I could whoop you today. That's what he was paraphrasing. That's what he was saying because the Corinthian church had all kinds of sexual immorality, all kinds of issues. He said, I could come to you this. He said, but he is saying, he, what Paul is saying is he's treating the Corinthian church with gentleness as God would treat them. He said, I could come to you this way. He said, but God releases gentleness to you, even in your misbehavior, even though you've been bad, right? And we know that as parents. We tell people, don't discipline your child in wrath. That takes some discipline of the Holy Spirit sometimes as parents, right? We want to whoop them sometimes, but if we're angry, we need to pull back and chill out a minute. They still need the discipline, but they need it correctly, because if, you, if, you, if, if God was a punisher, we would all be consumed with fire. We would not be here. I would not be breathing today. But God is not a punisher to his children. Right? God is love. And so gentleness. He is gentle. He is gentle. That's when you hear that little voice inside. It's him. Oh, wow. It's gentle. It's like this. This is an example. It's like if you tame a wild animal. Okay? It is not the animal, if you've ever been to a zoo, right, or any of those places where they tame lions or elephants, whatever. It, it has not lost its power or its strength, okay? But it has learned control to control its destructive instincts. The animal has learned to control itself. Who can tame us but God? Who can but the Holy Spirit, okay? And so that's a good example. That's what gentleness, we have been tamed by the power of Holy Spirit. We have been uh, instructed. We have allowed Holy Spirit to do this work. And so, and that causes the spirit of gentleness, causes us to be able to walk together in love. Who wants to be around a harsh person? Not me. You know, who wants to be around? Only by the power of God can we love people like that, right? And then if it says that a kind word turns away wrath, that means that I have the ability through the working of Holy Spirit and working a good warfare by the Holy Spirit, I can deal with those people that sometimes we have to live with because I have authority because Holy Spirit gives us authority. Remember that. Number nine, self-control, the last one. Oh, the opposite of self-control. Ah, unconstrained, unrestraint, overindulgence, self-control. Self-control is the ability to control one's own body and its sensual appetites and desires physically and mentally through the power of Holy Spirit. 
Self-control relates to both uh, chastity and sobriety, moderation and eating and drinking, self-discipline. It is the opposite of indulging in the flesh that indulges in sensual desires. So we know Proverbs 25, 28 says, like a city that is broken into without walls is a man who has no control over his own spirit. And then 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be of sober spirit, be on alert for the adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So self-control person is sober, okay? That's not hateful. That's not being sour. It means that they are alert. That means that they, they have discipline. They're paying attention to what's going on around them. And so if you have problems in these areas, you can fast and, and begin to do some fasting and that will crucify your flesh. It'll do it. It'll cause some discipline. Fasting will cause you to have self-discipline. Amen. It's very, very important. And so you say, well, how do I abide in these? And I'm through John 15, 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear what? Much fruit. If you remain in him and he's in you, you will bear these marks, the, attribute, the character of Holy Spirit. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And so let's stand up. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It is true. And see, we can talk about gifts and all those things, and, and we can demonstrate all the gifts, and that's wonderful, and we do that in here. And that causes people to jump, shout, and be excited. But boy, when you talk about producing fruit, you lose, folks. It's true. It happens. Why? Because that's not so fun. Right? But it's necessary. Because when you stand before God, it is, have you learned to f have you forgive and have you learned to love? What kind of fruit have you developed and grown? So, Father, we thank you. Just lift your hands. Thank you, Jesus. Go to the Sata. So, Father, we just give you glory. We just thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for a fresh wind of your spirit just being released in these, your people, today. Father, we thank you that we are fruit-bearing trees. Father God, we thank you, Father God, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Father, I ask that you would continue to deal with the areas of their heart, Father, where you're looking for some fruit in that area, Father, that they would continue to tend to the garden and the soil of their heart. Lord God, I just bless these, your people, Father. I seal the word that was released within them, and we just give you glory for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. If you're here today and you need special prayer, we invite you to come. If you're in here today and you need special prayer, you can come on up and we will minister to you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you need some prayer, some encouragement or anything, you can turn on a little bit of soft music and go ahead and we thank you, Lord. You can go ahead. Teresa, can you come? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Intercessors, can you begin to pray? We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, Father, for fruit. We thank you, Father. Yeah, so we just release grace over her to go. Yeah, we just thank you, Father. We just thank you, Father, for the grace to be able to go. Father, we surround her right now, Father, with your love. We thank you, Father, right now for the power of the Holy Spirit touching her. We thank you for healing to her belly. Father God, we just thank you for a breakthrough right now, Father God. We just, we just come against the enemy, Lord God, that would hinder her, Father. We bind and break every curse off right now. In the name of Jesus, I decree and declare it's going to be easy. It's going to be an easy time.